Um, I'm going to talk about a quite a bit narrower topic. I'm going to talk from two pers perspectives. One is a typical irresponsible academic. I, grad I advise PhD students, we do interesting studies, and we make recommendations that go out in the void and may or may not make any impact. But I, I wear another hat, which is I chair the Market Surveillance Committee of the uh, California Independent System Operator. I'm, I'm very fortunate to have followed uh, Frank Wallach in that responsibility. And I've, I've been on that committee for 20 years. And a lot of things have changed in power markets in the US over two decades. And I provide advice about how to change the market to uh, ensure that power can be delivered affordably, sustainably, and reliably. And the challenges 20 years ago, market power, for example, are very different than the challenges that we have today of going to 100% uh, variable renewables and batteries. Um, so what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit first about the structure of US power and carbon markets, and then talk about the issue that we have, which is, a systemic price for carbon does not exist for the entire United States. We do have carbon trading systems in some subsets of states, states that are embedded in larger markets. And so we have um, a carbon border adjustment problem, which I understand you're working very hard on. And, um, so, uh, Aude, you have been telling me a little bit about what uh, Europe is doing now, and I hope to learn more over the next couple of days and bring some lessons back. So, in these power markets, we've been wanting to try to do the right thing, to try to encourage carbon reductions that are somewhat cost effective through having some adjustments at the border of these states within the continental US. And so I'll talk a little bit about a model that I have to ad uh, address that problem. This is the irresponsible academic side. And, um, and then I'll also talk about the responsible side that I have in terms of uh, uh, my role on the, in, in the California carbon market. And finally, I'm going to make some conclusions about whether border carbon adjustments, at least for California, whether they provide cost-effective reductions, have the potential to do so, or whether it's counterproductive. Are we wasting our time? Um, OK, so first, about uh, the power markets in the US. Uh, we have power markets everywhere. Some of them are structured as unbundled um, independent system operator-based markets, where generators are separate from transmission, are separate from distributors. In other places, the gray places here, we still have vertical monopolies who, however, are obliged to make uh, access available to their grid for uh, independent generators. And uh, uh, this is the little place that I work for in California. Um, the US power markets are divided basically into three synchronized regions, just like you have Nord Pool and NSOE, uh, which are, uh, and uh, the UK, which are synchronized separately. We have the Eastern US, the Western US in North America, and the People's Republic of Texas, which stands in glorious isolation, which caused some problems a couple of years ago you may have heard about. Um, the markets on the left are, uh, have exchanges of energy, ancillary services, and long-term capacity. Okay, um, The markets on the right are energy only. So they're kind of similar to what you have in the EU with Euphemia, where you have a day ahead energy only market, uh, whereas the balancing authorities they take care of their operating reserves and, and resource adequacy. So side by side, we have an ISO-based integrated market, and we have energy-only markets. Um, the Western energy imbalance market, which covers all the colored areas, is the real-time market. 
uh, pretty much all of the West, almost all of the West, and the extended day ahead market is a new idea to try to do this day ahead. Um, and it will be operating, we hope, in, in a couple of years. Okay, carbon. Uh, we have the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, our, uh, Reggie in the Northeast, which has a cap and trade system. We have California, which you may think it's odd, is linked with the province of Quebec in, in Canada. Um, and we have a cap system in there. Um, uh, thanks to Governor Arnold, whom you may have seen on the big screen from time to time. And then finally, the state of Washington is establishing their own system. Um, each of these is embedded in regional power markets, California and Washington in the western markets, and uh, Reggie in the eastern markets, and power is exchanged from Maine all the way down to Key West, Florida. Uh, it's all a synchronized system. Uh, I'm not saying it's efficiently exchanged, but it is ex exchanged. So the problem we have, of course, is leakage. In particular, these are rough estimates. We don't know how much leakage takes place. But of the, re of the reductions that we uh, try to attain, the sort of goals that Andreas, Andreas talks about, uh, what fraction of reductions that we get within a region are compensated for by increases elsewhere because we're chasing, for example, we are chasing natural gas fired power plants out of California and the coal fired power plants in California have long been shut down but maybe have popped up elsewhere as a result. These are rough numbers. We don't know what the, the actual ones are. Maybe the most the, the best um, estimates are by Chiara Lepret recently, which is appearing in uh, J-A-E-R-E -E later this year. Um, the approaches that the states who recognize this leakage is occurring, the approaches that the states are taking to try to counter that um, can be grouped into the following. Uh, one approach is to penalize uh, financial offers to sell power here and there, or to adjust them, uh, penalize the offers from non-regulated regions, and maybe discount the offers from regulated regions uh, in the other direction. Um, so one approach is to uh, require that folks who are non-regulated regions like Arizona, who make offers into California uh, to sell power, that they have to increase their offers at the border by uh, something called the deemed emissions rate. What, uh, uh, what is their rate of uh, carbon emissions times the price per ton? And this has been implemented in California. Um, what's interesting, of course, is what this deemed rate should be. The, the, the difficulty is it's all one big grid and power plants dump their power into the grid, and consumers take their power out of the grid, and you cannot, it's, it, it's a fool's errand to try to trace power from source, source to sink. Um, nevertheless, we do make power deals. I can buy power from 50-year-old power plants in Norway, if I live down here in, in, in Italy, if I wanted to, and that would have a zero rate and so I wouldn't owe anything. It's, of course, a physical fiction, but it's an, it's an accounting uh, reality. Um, in California, we do this. We actually do allow source-specific rates. So if you buy old hydro plants, power, you don't have to pay anything uh, for carbon. Or, alternatively, you could use the marginal emissions rate for the region. Uh, saying that, well, whether you're buying it in name from a hydro plant in Washington or a coal plant in New Mexico, somewhere in the western U.S. there's going to be a power plant that adjusts upwards. And it really doesn't matter where you, in a counting sense, buy it from. What really matters is where it's in a physical sense. Um, an alternative approach, and this was proposed for New York, um, is 
decrease the price that the folks who are sending dirty power into New York decrease the price that they would get in New York for that power by the emissions rate of New York power plants times this price of carbon. So A focuses on the emissions rates of the exporters, B focuses on the emissions rates of the, of the importers. And it's possible to combine those to say, well, which is really the marginal source? And the Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland power pool, which has most of the Reggie states, considered that. In addition, there are quantity limits on offers. So not just price adjustments, but quantity limits. Uh, and this happens in two steps. Um, it's not just professors who come up with counterfactuals, alternative modeling worlds to compare the actual world against. And we do this in power systems too. We run a counterfactual. We say, what would have happened if there were no imports to California? What power plants would have been turned on? And then second, we run the actual market and we limit the accepted import offers to generation that is increased relative to this counterfactual. Okay, there are all sorts of problems with all of these. We have the famous contract shuffling problem where I'm buying Norwegian hydropower rather than coal power from Poland, um, uh, for example, and, um, if, uh, and so it looks like I'm buying green power when I'm really not. Furthermore, grid congestion means that the uh, marginal emissions rate is not unique and is hard to predict. The second approach, the New York State approach, um, provides no incentive for clean resources in non-regulated markets to lower, lower their emissions. Um, in California, the issue is the use of a base schedule based on existing import contracts doesn't do much good if 80 or 90 percent of power is sold by these contracts. And we still have congestion. We have a weird situation where if you allow imports into California, some power plants will go up in some places in the West, but others will go down because of the weird nature of power flows, in which case that gives you more degrees of freedom to choose the cleaner plants to, to, to blame for imports. Okay, so here are the questions. Does it do any good or not? And how does that depend on the precise uh, uh, design and parameterization of the of the mechanism, and I use an ex-ante market equilibrium model that both adjusts investment, what type of power plants and transmission lines are built. I'm actually an electrical engineer in part, and so I wanted to have a network because the network really does affect uh, the market. Um, it also represents, of course, operating or dispatch decisions. Um, and it winds up being a, a linear program with 10 million variables or so, a few more variables than Andreas had in his model. Of course, the disadvantage of a model like mine is that coming up with general results, as Andreas was able to do, um, is, is, is nearly impossible. But I can say something specific about my market, and we can use that as a basis for implementation. So we'll look at Western North American markets in the year 2034, where we're in a second best world of carbon limits in, 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 in California, but not elsewhere. Um, and we also have things like limited trading of renewable energy credits with the rest of the West, lo uh, local content requirements. Um, and so here's our design choice. Our design choice for the border uh, carbon adjustment is we can either trace um, uh, the sources and penalize by the source, um, or all imports must pay the same penalty, no matter if you're contracted with a hydro resource or a coal resource. And there are various different levels of de deemed rates, and these can be static, fixed ahead of time, or they can be dynamic and depend on system conditions. So here is my last substantive slide. Um, these show results in terms of total emissions in the West and 
total cost. We would like a Pareto optimum in the sense that we have a solution for which no other solution exists that has both lower costs, all resource costs, and lower total, total emissions. So here is the plot we would like to be towards the southwest. We have about 300 million tons per year emitted in the western US. And here's our uh, annual cost is about $30 billion per year. And in the lower right is our base case. If there is no uh, 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 border carbon adjustment, this is where we would be, um, 280 million tons. Then I try all sorts of different border carbon adjustments with a background of different carbon prices within California. So here are different adjustments when we have $20 per ton, $40, $60, and $80 per ton. And um, disturbingly, you see that some of the adjustments make emissions worse by a couple million tons and increase costs, completely counterproductive. And this is not even talking about the transaction costs of setting this thing up. On the other hand, it is possible to lower emissions. Um, so what are these different policies? If you have dynamic deemed rates that are based on marginal emissions in the West and change day to day, you can a lower, lower emissions, but as you see here, you know, this is a couple of percent. This is not getting us to 90% reductions or 100% reductions. We're straining at gnats, I'm afraid. Um, and it depends on, on the price. With different fixed rates of emissions, we may lower emissions, we might not. And finally, some of these points are facility-based. If you sign a contract with a hydro facility, um, you get lower emissions. Those tend to be completely unproductive, raising costs and perhaps even raising emissions. So that's discouraging. Um, so we can do some good. Um, and actually, the system that we have is a mix of these two. But if we went t entirely with marginal rates, uh, which I actually recommended in the year 2007, um, was not listened to, but that's usually the case. Um, we can lower uh, emissions at about 30 bucks a ton, which is, cost of, which, which is a reasonable cost, but compared to emissions trading west-wide, you could lower costs by $5 a ton, so that's still pretty price, pricey. The best thing is, everybody knows, is a systemic price. So to conclude, uh, the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments in the U.S., which created a sulfur trading system, has been the model for trading systems around the world and uh, partially inspire the Europe European, of course, the emissions trading system in, uh, in Europe. Uh, unfortunately, I stood in front of the IAEE uh, meeting in Vienna in 2009 and said, we're about to get carbon trading throughout the U.S. thanks to President uh, Obama's bill. Well, that did not happen. There is no prospect of a systemic carbon price in the U.S., so we're constantly searching for second best policies. Luckily, we did get the um, Inflation Reduction Act, which is based on technology subsidies. Um, but we're going to be stuck in terms of carbon pricing with uncoordinated state trading and renewable portfolio standards, which I'm afraid only contribute incrementally. Uh, luckily, the IRA will make a bigger impact. I'm afraid that uh, border carbon adjustments for the US, at best, make a couple, two or three percent difference. There's not much California can do to make Arizona lower its emissions. That's uh, the case. Realizing that they were largely ineffective and would be very compl uh, complicated to implement. The New York and PJM have given up on preventing leakage, largely given up on preventing leakage from the REGI system in the Northeast. It's just not, not worth the effort, very, very, very sad to say. Um, but California is still pushing on. We have a system in place. There's some reason to believe it's helping a little, 
and it makes us feel like we're, we're doing the right thing and maybe we'll get some experience from it. So with that, I'll conclude. Thanks again, Simone, and everybody for inviting me this morning.